started off with a specific anchor, CRM or, or Intuit, uh, with their financial applications. That's the anchor for the platform, and over time they have opened up the APIs, so you might have a company that has a specialized application area rather than building from scratch and, and, and building their infrastructure tools. They will sit them on top of that existing infrastructure. The third then is the enabling technology that sort of fills out the white space. People like uh, Rightscale who have management for an Amazon cloud. And, and of course, none of this would have happened. We wouldn't have gotten where we are today if it wasn't for the software as a service movement taking applications outside of the data center, full applications, and telling people, listen, we can run this application better than you can, more cost effectively, more flexibly, more easily, and then getting IT and users comfortable with the fact that it's going to be reliable, it's going to be scalable, and it'll work, and it'll do what you need it to do and be um, secure. So, so all these things, okay, that, so, that all drives that. So there are two aspects of software as a service that are very important, and in a sense that have changed the nature of software. If you are a customer and you buy into software as a service and you do the one month trial, if you can't quickly use that application, if it's not intuitive to you, you're, you're, you're going to drop off af after that one month trial and never use it again. So I think it's having a big impact on the usability of applications. So these are all external, so let's talk about private clouds for a minute. All right, anybody know this guy? <laughs> all right, so this is John Landry. John was the, John was the CTO at, at uh, Lotus Development. He's a uh, venture capitalist. And uh, Judith was running a session at the Mass Technology Leadership Conference on Cloud 101. Somebody started talking about private clouds. And then from the back of the room in this deep, booming voice, that's, the, that's just the data center. And that was, that was John Landry. And he's right. But it wasn't exact. But he's not exactly right. It is the data center. Private clouds are the data center. So what are we talking about, Judith? So it, it, private clouds are very interesting because part part of this is it depends on the size of your company. So if you are a Fortune 50 company and you want to provide more self-service capability within your data center to your internal customers, you want to have some elasticity there. There's no reason that you go knock on the door to Google or an Amazon to do a cloud. You probably become your own cloud provider. In other situations, you have companies that say, I'm interested in this cloud stuff, but um, I will hire an integrator to build me one because I want to try it for myself. I may at some point trust a public cloud enough to do it, but I'm going to try it on my own. Or I may, I, I may decide that what I'm doing is, is so secure and so special and is my crown jewels that I will never let it out. Or I, I'm a regulated industry and, if, and, and I need to, to promise that I will never let go of, of my information. I'll have uh, uh, total uh, governance control over it. Or perhaps I, I have very specialized rules. My data can't leave France. So I'm not going to put it on a cloud because that cloud um, uh, platform might be in a different company. Kind and so, you know, how do you build a private cloud? It's very simple. You, you start with your hardware. That's where the no hardware doesn't apply. It's your hardware. You add a virtualization layer and you add some APIs. And there are companies that can actually do this for you that are listed here. And this is, again, not an exhaustive list. But all of these companies that are listed up here actually can take and provide private cloud services to uh, an enterprise. And, and in fact, you're seeing companies like EMC, like IBM, uh, a, a, a bunch of, um, of other companies, 3Terra, uh, a bunch of others that are actually building private clouds as a business for their customers. Now, you take your public cloud and a private cloud, and can you marry them together? Can you get an environment that is elastic but spans the public and private? And that's the notion of what is a hybrid cloud. And really, a hybrid cloud, again, is just that. It is a piece of, uh, a bit of your public cloud, uh, multiple public cloud infrastructures, perhaps, and private cloud, and maybe some kind of a control bubble around that that includes automation, that includes security, that includes business policies and governance uh, technologies that have the, the tools to be able to move uh, uh, computing load 
from one platform to the next. And so I'll, that's I'll just give you a very uh, quick example of, of somebody who would do both. So a company that is selling the service to retailers, it helps them manage their digital gift cards, and they offer that as service to retailers. So they are using a public cloud for the retailers to access information and to update, um, to, to get updates to how much money is flowing on these digital cards. But the data about their customers and transactions, they don't want to put that in a public cloud. They use 3 Terra to create a private cloud for that specific data. So that's an example of somebody who's taking a hybrid approach. So what, are, what things are stopping people from actually adopting cloud technologies? You've talked to a lot Security. of CIOs. Security, governance, it's mine, I want to keep it. I have such a big data center as it is. It's good, it works. I may want to modify it, I may want to streamline it, add more provisioning, make it more elastic, but you know, there's no reason why I can't be my own cloud provider. Then there's the issue of interoperability. Amazon built a cloud, Rackspace built a cloud, right? Engineer has a cloud. Google has a cloud. Salesforce has a cloud. If you write an application to run in Salesforce, can you run it at Amazon? The answer is no. If you wrote it, run it, uh, uh, wrote it uh, in a way that is uh, using Google App Engine, can you run it at Amazon or Rackspace? Or you can run it? Can you run it at Microsoft? The answer is no. Interoperability just doesn't exist. Now there's a lot of people talking about interoperability, but it's not happening today. So if you're going to do, if you build an application that is very specific to a cloud platform, you are kind of stuck with that for a while, or it's harder to move. And so this interoperability issue, I think, is also something that is slowing the adoption. If we get that right, if we get all these things right, we have this new concept that has been. Uh, has anybody heard this term intercloud before? This is very new. Only in the last two months have I started seeing blogs and articles written about the intercloud. This is the future, not today. And it's probably what? Well, I think it's about 10 years away. And so um, what, what this really is, is the ability for you to write an application and have it exist or run <coughs> ubiquitously in anybody's cloud, and to have services in those clouds that are standardized and interoperable. And if you think about public switch telephone networks, this is not, AT&T might have built the biggest network, but they were not the only carrier in the U.S. <coughs> in order for the other carriers to route traffic onto AT&T, they had to adopt standards. Think of this also in railroads. Early railroad builders built different width of widths of their train tracks. So you drove your train up to the end of their track, and there was another track there, but it was the wrong width. You couldn't drive across that line. When they standardized on rails, when they standardized on te telecommunications protocols for connecting that, then the market was much more interesting and, and it grew, and that will happen in the cloud, but I think you're right, 10 years. So we're in an evolutionary phase here. This is not revolutionary. This is all building on the path. It's building right. on what, mainframes? You, you know, a lot of times, and John and I were talking about this earlier, you will hear comments like, oh, this isn't new. Th this stuff has been around for a long time, and that is absolutely true. There, there's actually, there is nothing new under the sun or the cloud for that matter. The technologies evolve over successes and failures over many years. So, so it is definitely built on the experience of the last, uh, of since you know 1969, the, the way we started this session. Okay, and last kind of key point here is that we're still in the wild west days. We're still in the time when things are new and people are experimenting, and this is kind of the most fun time. I mean, the people that got out there and, and mined the oil, you know, got the oil, mined the gold, built the cities, people that kind of broke the ground, they're the ones that, you know, some of them got broke, but a lot of them got rich. Some of them were, um, had a lot of fun, and this is the building phase, uh, and, and it is really wild west, because there's all, people are experimenting with all sorts of very interesting things. People are, companies are being invested in that are trying new things that have never been done before, and, it, and it's going to be fascinating over the next several years to watch. So we're going to see a lot of innovation, um, a lot of interesting things. There are going to be areas that, that are going to, to be commoditized very quickly. You don't see a lot of new uh, Yahoo.com or uh, Gmail um, email services uh, e you know, coming out um, of the cloud. So there's certain areas that, that are actually, in terms of vendor, areas are contracting, but there are new ones that, that, that there's just going to be 
again, that wild west with lots of opportunities.